Welcome back to our Hebrews Bible study. As we begin today, I thought today we'd change it up a little bit, and I'd talk to you about one of my favorite songs. You see, when I was growing up, uh, my friends and I, we used to joke around, and, and we used to have fun little songs and kind of joke around and, and gag around with each other. And there was one particular song by the great Johnny Cash that we used to love, and it's called A Boy Named Sue. If, you ever heard, if you've never heard this song, go look it up on YouTube or Apple Music or Spotify or one of these deals because it's a riot and it will make you laugh. And for those of us who were 10-year-old boys at the time, we thought this was hilarious because the song started off like this. It says, My daddy left home when I was three. He didn't leave much for Ma and me. Just his hero guitar and an empty bottle of booze was a good old country song. But I didn't blame him because he ran and hid. But the meanest thing that he ever did was before he left, he went and named me Sue. So it's all about this boy who's growing up whose name is Sue. And he goes along throughout his entire life and everywhere he goes, he's getting into brawls and fights and he's fighting people because everybody is making fun of him for being named Sue. And everybody thinks he's sissy and that he can't stand up for himself because his name is Sue. Well, finally, when he grows up, he happens to walk into the same tavern as his daddy. And his daddy and him start talking and they have a conversation. He doesn't know it's him. And then all of a sudden, both of them are illuminated to the fact that they are father and son. So the first thing that Sue, the character of this story, does is he swings at his father and he knocks him out. And they get in this huge brawl that pours out in the street and they're getting ready to have a good old Texas shootout. And all of a sudden, daddy starts laughing. And he says, son, this world is rough. And if a man's going to make it, he's got to be tough. And that's why I gave you that name, to carry you through. And the reason that he called him Sue was because he knew that his son had to be so tough, so hard, that he would have to endure anything to make it through without his father. Now luckily, as believers, we're not separated from our father. But our identity is heavily founded in the name that God gives us. And we carry a special name that is found throughout Scripture. You see, we're God's church. We're to find our identity in that. We belong to Him. And in fact, throughout Scripture, when God is describing His church, He describes it as the bride of Christ, meaning somebody that He cherishes and loves so much that He was willing to give His life for it. And so, as such, we should find our identity in the fact that we are in the church. That is our name. We are God's church. And before Hebrews concludes, the author leaves some parting words. It's almost like the father who was leaving left a name for his son. He leaves some parting words to the church there that he's talking to. And in Hebrews chapter 13, we find these parting words, and he gives some instructions as to what the church is supposed to be, and what it's supposed to look like. And I've got five things in Hebrews 13 that the church is supposed to be like, that we're, qualities that we're supposed to exhibit and things that we're supposed to do that I think is relevant to us today. Number one, the church needs to be a place of love. We have to be a place of love. Hebrews 13 verses 1 through 3, the author goes on. He says, keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers. For by doing so, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. Continue to remember those in prison as if you were together with them in prison and those who were mistreated as if you yourselves were suffering. Now, if that's not real love, I don't know what is. See, we're called to love one another as brothers and sisters, meaning the people that are there in your small group Bible study right now, you're supposed to love them as much as siblings. Now, I know that could be kind of tough because we've got different relationships with our siblings. But you're supposed to consider them blood relatives, family, that close. So much so that in verse 2 he says, And don't forget, if that's not scary enough, to show hospitality to strangers. Meaning people that you've never even met we're supposed to show hospitality towards. This is who the church is supposed to be. And every week, every Sunday, we have folks come in and out of our lives that we're not just supposed to let them pass by and off into eternity. No, instead we're supposed to show hospitality to them. This is why in our churches we do everything from greeting people to loving them to caring on them. It doesn't matter if it's their first time, their second time, their third time, their fourth time, however many times that they come, we're supposed to show hospitality to them. 
And then the author ups the ante that much more so when he says, even when you are receiving a stranger, you need to take it as if you were entertaining angels because you might be doing that. Now, how high does that up the bar for us? That if we were to receive a stranger in our household, that we might be thinking in the back of our mind, what if this is a messenger from God? sent to either tell us something or to test us in this given moment. That is raising the standard on our hospitality to a degree that many of us haven't even considered. And then not only for those that we receive into our lives, but many of which society has forgotten about. Now I want you to think about this because he puts an emphasis here on remembering those in prison as if you were together with them in prison. This is society's forgotten. These are the downtrodden. These are the people who are punished For a long period of time, the society has decided, hey, you know what? You are unfit to be out with us right now. You have to be locked away because of your crimes. Here, the author of Hebrews is saying, do not forget about them. Display love and affection to them. Now, why might that be? Could it be that this is their opportunity to hear the gospel? Could it be that you and I are being sent to them to demonstrate God's love and care and affection? That even while we were yet sinners, Christ showed love, care, and affection and gave his life for us. That we might be able to do so with others. I think that could be the case. And so we're supposed to be a place of love. We should be a people of love. Showing hospitality to others, whether we know them or not. Caring for one another as our brothers and sisters. So the church needs to be a place of love. But the church also, and this is the second thing, it needs to honor the family. The church needs to honor the family. After talking about loving one another and remembering those who are forgotten, in verse 4, he says, Marriage should be honored by all, and the marriage bed kept pure, for God will judge the adulterer and the sexually immoral. He places a heavy emphasis on this, because the family is the first thing that's instituted by God. All the way back in the Old Testament in creation, when God places Adam and Eve in the garden, the first thing he says is, and this is why a man will leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. You see, the home is sanctified before God. It is a pure and set-apart thing. And what we have in marriage, it should be honored by all. We the church, the family of God. We need to honor the family. We need to honor the home. Now, I know that for some of you who may be watching this study right now may be thinking, well, I'm single and I'm not necessarily in that step of life, and so how does this necessarily work for me? Well, let me tell you, this means that marriage should be honored by us. It's not something to just put off. It's not something to fight against. It's not something to say, oh, well, this is just for that type of people and I'm not necessarily ready for this. See, that's not honoring what God had instituted. It means that we uphold it, that we love it, that we cherish it, and that we look forward to having it in the way that God has set forth his guidelines. Why? Because it matters to him. So marriage should be honored by all. And why? He gives a warning here. God will judge the adulterer and the sexually immoral. So that means for those of you who are single, that means what God has set bounds for marriage, you keep in marriage, and you honor marriage by doing that. And for those of us who are married, that what God has set for marriage, we keep within the confines of our marriage. We're not taking that to other relationships. We're not looking for excess or extra relationships. And the church should be the place where this is supported, loved, and honored. The church needs to be the place that honors the family. Next thing. The church needs to be devoid of greed. After talking about loving others and after talking about marriage in verse 5, he says this, Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Because God has said, Never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, The Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? Now this to me is significant because over and over again, back in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus talks about the contrast between serving God and serving money. Why is it that money is always the competitor for our hearts? Jesus doesn't say God or Satan. 
He's not saying light and darkness in this moment. No, instead, he's telling us to keep our lives free from the love of money, much like the author of Hebrews is. Why? Because it's so tempting. Because it's so distracting. And because each and every one of us can be caught up and because it can be the thing that takes our eyes off of Jesus and onto our given circumstances. And so the church needs to be the place where we keep our lives free from the love of money and where we demonstrate and model contentment. In, in our world today, we're taught that he who dies with the most toys wins. We're taught that we're supposed to accumulate fame and possessions for ourselves. Everything from social media to what we see on television on a regular basis is telling us more and more and more what you have is old, it's not enough, you're not happy, you're not satisfied yet, you don't have anything yet. And yet, the author of Hebrews is telling us none of those things will satisfy. None of them will satisfy. They can't do it. They won't fill that void that's inside your soul. Instead, he says, to keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Why? Because God said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my help. I will not be afraid. In other words, he is more than enough. He is more than enough. If you had God and nothing else, you would still have more than enough to be content. And that's what we have in Christ. And so in all areas, in all stages of life, whether the bank account's full or whether it's empty, whether we're living the lavish lifestyle or whether we're down in the ditches, we can find contentment and joy in Christ. And we are to keep our lives free from the love of money. Number four, the church needs to support its leaders. It needs to support its leaders. In Hebrews 13, 7, he, he goes on, he says, Remember your leaders. And he's talking specifically about church leaders here. He goes on, who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Wow, what a strong bar for those of us who lead in the church. What a, what a high bar for us to know that people are going to imitate our way of life. And so we've got to keep our standards high, but at the same time, and this is an encouragement from a pastor, I love it when my congregation tells me that they pray for me. Why? Because that means that they care. And I want you to know, you are to remember your pastors and leaders at the church. Why? Because God has called them to something difficult and something significant. They're supposed to be living this life and demonstrating it for you. And then he goes on to say, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. And then here comes a warning. Do not be carried away by all kinds of strange teachings. It is good for our hearts to be strengthened by grace not by eating ceremonial foods, which is of no benefit to those who do so. We have an altar from which those who minister at the tabernacle have no right to eat. So now he's telling us not just to remember our leaders, but don't go looking for strange doctrines. Resist them. Stay away from them. If you recognize strange teaching that's going on in the church, you need to stop it right where it's at. You need to support your leadership, and you need to pray for them, and you need to be the upholder of doctrine wherever you are at. This is the encouragement that's given to those within the church, not just to pastors and leaders, but to all. We are all responsible for guarding the gate, to making sure that false doctrine does not spread throughout the church family. Because when one person gets infected, then the next thing you know, another person can and another person can. And salvation, which is by grace through faith, goes back to being salvation by works. So he's warning us. Oh, no, 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 no. Don't go back to that old way of life. Let's all be the standard bearers. Let's all raise the bar. And then in verse 17, he says this about our leaders. He says, have confidence in your leaders. Wow, that's trust. Have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. Do this so that their work will be a joy and not a burden for that would be of no benefit to you. Now, this is a warning for those of us who are leaders in the church. One day, we have to give an account to God for the people that we're leading, for the flock that God has entrusted with our care. Small group leader in your home, what you have is something that's so significant and so powerful. God has entrusted you with the people in your living room, with the people in your Bible study, that he has brought them to you and he has entrusted you with them, and one day we're going to have to give an account. And for those who are following, submit. 
Not because we're so great, but because we are keeping watch over your souls. And so let's do this joyfully together. Let's be a joyful family with one another together and not burdensome to one another because it's of no benefit. The church is supposed to be a house of love. And then finally, the church needs to be a place of worship. It needs to be a house of worship. In verses 15 and 16 in chapter 13, the author of Hebrews says this, Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess his name. So he's not saying, hey, let's go back to the old sacrificial system. Instead, he's saying, no, let's offer praises to God. And then he says this, and do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices, God is pleased. The church is supposed to be a house of worship. When we enter into his gates, we're supposed to come with thanksgiving. When we enter his courts, we're supposed to come with praise. We come singing joyfully, loudly, and happily because our God has come through for us. He has established such a wonderful covenant through Jesus, his son. And as we've looked through the book of Hebrews, we've seen God come through on promise after promise after promise. How then are we to live overflowing with praise by being a family that worships together? And so as we conclude this study, I want you to think through how we as a church can continue to serve God through these five ways. How we can love each other better. We need to be a house of love. How we can honor the family, the home that God instituted. How we can be devoid of greed, no matter how difficult it may be. How we can support our leadership. And how we can be a place of worship. Let's go to our God now in prayer. Father, we thank you so much for this time. And Lord, we thank you for the book of Hebrews. Father, what a powerful word you have given us. And God, we thank you for the covenant that you have made with your people. God, that is not dependent on us, but dependent on Christ and what he has accomplished for us. Father, we pray that we as your church, God, would not find our identity in anything else but you. And Lord, we pray that we would exhibit the qualities that are outlined for us here. God, may we be more loving. God, may we uphold the family. Father, may we be devoid of greed. May we support our leaders, and Father, may we please be a house of worship that lifts up the sacrifice of praise through our lips to you. God, we thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you as you go on in your study.